Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Hillary. Uh, my name is Joe Evinger. Hillary Naylor and I are the two group co-host of this presentation. Hillary will, is also here to help us with any technical problems we might have. Uh, uh, I, I want to welcome all of you to Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. Um, uh, my name is Joe. I help coordinate the group's events. All of these events uh, have ver uh, include speakers of, on various topics. Our members have varied educational work experience backgrounds, but we all share a common interest in science and new ideas. We currently have about 50 members in our group plus another 50 people who often join us as guests. We meet via Zoom the second Thursday of every month from three o'clock until roughly 4.30. We have a different guest speaker. Uh, each month, we rely on our group members and all attendees and members of Ashby Village to uh, furnish us with names and prospects of uh, future speakers. Uh, besides our presentation today, I'm always recruiting for these speakers. Uh, let, me, let me tell you who's coming up. In April, we have a vaccine researcher who's going to tell us how HIV and AIDS research helped give us the COVID-19 vaccines. In May, I have a member of the Golden Gate Audubon Society who will go over the history of a local wildlife refuge and talk to us about its re resident birds. Uh, later this year, uh, part three of our a series on ancient human dispersals out of Africa will be the topic. This has been very popular and, this, and we're going to hear some of the more relatively recent ancient uh, human dispersals out of Africa. I have a volcanologist coming to speak to us in the fall. Uh, and I have someone to tell us about new technologies that BART brought in some 50 years ago but back then were brand new untried technologies. But today, when we want to welcome Lewis Feldman, director of the UC Botanical Garden. Uh, Lewis is a graduate of UC Davis and received his PhD from Harvard, after which he came to Berkeley on a postdoc fellowship. Subsequently, he joined the faculty of the UC Department of Botany, now the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology, where he has spent his entire career as a professor of plant biology. He is a plant developmental biologist and for his research has focused on root development. He remains involved in teaching and has served as a longtime instructor at Berkeley's large introductory biology class with over 750 students. His main thrust as director of the UC Botanical Garden is to ensure that the plant collection is curated and well-managed, which involves raising funds to maintain and update facilities and caring for the plants. Additionally, as director, he works to promote the garden activities, conservation, education, and research. I want to also point out that for you should have all received as part of your email uh, a generous offer from uh, uh, Lou Feldman to join the Botanical Gardens at a substantial discount. You, uh, you're welcome to do that. That offer is good for the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, if for some reason you did not get that offer, contact me. Hillary will give you a post for you my email address and I will see, see that you get that. With that long introduction, I would like to introduce Dr. Lewis Feldman. Okay, let's see if we get this to work here. Uh, how is that? Can you see it? Not yet. Not yet. I think we're going to have to start it all over again. So let's, uh, um, I'll think we have to share screen again. Let's see if this, okay, let's try this. Uh, share. There we go. There okay. you go. How about, it? okay? Looks good. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate having this opportunity to talk about the garden. Uh, as uh, Joe introduced me, I want you to know that uh, I've been a longtime faculty member in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. And uh, when I was thinking about retiring, uh, this other career, namely as director of the garden, uh, appeared and I didn't, didn't stand in line for it. Uh, they, they fired the director who was here before me and uh, um, they needed somebody to step in and they were willing to take me, which I'm, I'm pleased to say 
has turned out to be a, a very interesting experience. The garden, as most of you know, is located in Strawberry Canyon. It's on the Berkeley campus, although we're actually in Oakland uh, rather than in Berkeley where the lines are drawn. Uh, this is a view of the entrance to the garden. And uh, what I'd like to do today, and this is an outline of the talk, uh, is to break it down into these four topics. Maybe there'll be some other topics we touch upon as we move through to give you an overview of the garden and uh, how it uh, interfaces both with the campus and with the public. Now, the mission of the garden as we have it here is to maintain, and I'll talk about this, uh, a very diverse living collection of plants. And this uh, maintenance is in support of the mission of the university's role in teaching and really in worldwide research. We also have added on to it uh, another emphasis, which is conservation. And I'll talk about conservation. And for me, the reason I took this position is because I feel that the future of humanity is going to depend upon our ability uh, to partner with the natural and environment, in particular to partner with plants. Now, why have a botanical garden? And as I've touched on before, the simple answer is that our future uh, depends upon us being able to interact with the environment and to be able to understand what these organisms provide, not only to our lives as far as food and purifying the atmosphere, but also for pleasure that it gives us. Now, in this time of climate change, which many of you are probably very concerned about, <clears throat> the garden has a, a role as serving as a resource for the history of plants and also as a place for maintaining um, plants which are rare and endangered, and in some cases, uh, plants uh, which have already disappeared from the natural environment. And many people have thus said that the garden is kind of like a Noah's Ark, uh, a topic or a, a thought we'll return to a little later on. For those of you who have recently looked at the New York Times, this is a picture of the uh, US uh, with uh, areas where biodiversity is most highly threatened. And if you look at California, the redder the color, the more likely are there to be species which have their biodiversity or their life cycles um, affected uh, by changes in climate, by changes in the environment. You can see California is the most imperiled of all the biodiversity states in the contiguous United States. And for this reason, because of the imperiling of the uh, biodiversity, the Botanical Garden at Berkeley and other units which have plants as we have here, take on an increasingly important role in helping us to uh, not only mitigate climate change, but also to preserve species which are near extinction or whose environments uh, will cause the species to become extinct because the environments are changing so drastically. So this is a very important map. It really does uh, emphasize the centrality, the importance of a place like the Berkeley Botanical Gardens, which we will touch upon as we go through the talk today. If you look at uh, some of the data, and this is only up to 2010, these data show something of the way groups are classified with regard to whether they're highly endangered, whether they are considered to be vulnerable. And what I wanna point out to you in these different classifications, which include not only plants, but other groups of uh, animals and organisms, that uh, there are a large number of plants which fall into the various categories of endangered, highly endangered, or vulnerable. So that if you look at um, the total at the bottom, there are a large number of plants which are important to the environment, but which are potentially facing extinction. And these are the data which uh, inform many of the activities which go on here in the garden, and hopefully will inform individuals who are in the position to make decisions about our environment. Now the UC Botanical Garden uh, was one of the first uh, organizations formed after the Berkeley campus was formed. It started in 1890 by this uh, very proper looking gentleman here, Edward Green. And for those of you who know the Berkeley campus, uh, Green set up the garden in what was at the time the main part of the Berkeley campus, but was considered to be kind of a, an outlying portion of the, of the, uh, the campus. Here we have uh, a greenhouse which was uh, set up in the, in the 1890s. It was meant to mimic the greenhouse, uh, if it no longer exists, but mimic the greenhouse in style that you find in the conservatory in San Francisco. And this greenhouse is located or was located in a portion of the campus 
um, which uh, later was uh, occupied uh, by buildings, as I will show you in a moment. So as the campus began to grow, and although the garden was on the periphery of uh, the main campus, the campus began to approach the garden territory and began to gobble up land which belonged to the garden. Here is a view uh, of the garden to show you how close it was. This is the library, as some of you may know, uh, the steps of the library are facing to the north. And you can see that the garden actually comes right up to what's one of the main buildings on the campus. And this was in 1924. So about the mid twenties, it became evident that the garden could no longer remain on the main campus and a new home was sought for the botanical garden. And uh, when uh, the new home was uh, established, and we'll talk about that in a moment, in place of the conservatory, just to orient some of you, is the East Asian Library. We're now standing on the steps of the library and looking toward the East Asian Library and the grassy area was occupied as was the hill where the uh, East Asian Library is by the original botanical garden. In the late 1920s, the garden moved up to Strawberry Canyon where we are now located. Strawberry Canyon uh, land uh, was before the garden moved up a dairy farm. And uh, there are still some structures here in the garden which date back to the time of the dairy farm. And uh, if any of you come up and you'd like to see them, uh, they're not on the public viewing, but I'd be glad to show them to you. For those of you who know the botanical garden, there's a, a lawn area of the garden. This is the lawn that, in fact, the only lawn area of the garden which was the original area of the garden that was developed. Now, since 1996, uh, the garden has been administered by the Office of the Vice Chancellor of Research. And as a result, the garden is part of a consortium of museums, natural history museums on the campus, which include the Anthropology Museum, the Herbarium, the Museum of Vertebrate Zo Zoology, and the Essex Insect Museum. So we are part of those museums. Now, what is the Botanical Garden? What are we not? Well, first of all, the UC Botanical Garden is not a demonstration garden. It is not a garden where we have masses of a couple of plants which have color and which provide ideally a beautiful restful spot. This is not what the UC Botanical Garden is. UC Botanical Garden is a specimen garden. And I'll talk about the specimen garden a little more for you later on. We have plants from all continents except the Antarctic. We have a Is it over five representing different geographical regions. We have eight special collections, which I'll touch upon. We have a large number of plants, 13,000 different kinds of plants. And every time a plant is added to the garden, it's called an accession. And as I mentioned earlier, for many people then, the garden serves as a kind of plant arc, as a, as a Noah's Ark of plants. Now, if there's one slide uh, for this audience in particular, that I, that I want to leave a message on. It is the following slide. Over or nearly 70% of the plants which we have here in the garden are wild collected or they are grown from wild collected seed. That means that we have a tremendous amount of knowledge on each of these plants, where they were growing, what the soil types were like, what are the plants they were growing with and other information which is extremely invaluable to researchers. As importantly, because these are plants which are collected from the wild, they contain, and this is probably a most important point, they contain the wild type or original genetic information, the DNA of plants which have been growing in these areas for hundreds if not thousands of years. They contain the history of the plants. They are not hybrids. Hybrids, as shown in the previous slide, are plants which have much of their original DNA either bred out or suppressed with regard to expression. Here we have the plants which contain their original genetic record. And the reason why I wanna emphasize this as being so important is that because we are going to live in a changing climate, a changing environment, we're gonna to have to depend upon the ability of plants and other organisms to be able to adapt to these changes in the environment. And these changes are dependent upon the genetic information which is present in these organisms. And by, producing hybrids by producing plants in which you limit the amount of DNA which is expressed, you're also limiting the ability of those plants to adapt to changes in the environment. And so this garden has a main function of being essentially a living collection of the DNA of these plants, which we are as humans going to increasingly 
depend upon if we're going to be able to survive as a species. It's very important that people appreciate. And this is what makes this garden almost unique in the world in that we are continually trying to collect and only house in our garden plants which are wild type, plants which have their original DNA. This is a very important point which distinguishes the UC Botanical Garden from most gardens in the world. If you look at uh, the signs on the plants as you walk in and you peruse through the garden, and there are two of these signs shown in the lower portion of this particular slide, you will notice that there's a number on the sign in the upper right-hand corner. That number conveys a lot of information. The first part of the number is the year the plant was put into the garden. So for example, in the lower left-hand corner, the number begins with 36. That plant to which the sign is attached was put into the garden in 1936. And that year it was a 1234th plant, which was added to the garden. That number, which you see on the upper right-hand corner of the sign, takes you, if you're interested, to our, if you look at our webpage, to a database which provides you or researchers or students with a vast amount of information freely available to the public on these plants. It's really important. This is uh, what is involved in curation in a curatorial garden, which we are. So I want to encourage you when you come to the garden, spend a few minutes looking at the signage and you'll get a lot of information from it. We frequently, uh, when we have children come to the garden, we frequently tell them about that year uh, and what it means. And we ask them to find a, a plant which has the year in which they were born. And this drives kids all over the garden looking for signs and looking at the plants more closely than they probably would to see if the plant and they have the same birth year. Now, when you take that number and you enter our database, you can actually put it into uh, a spreadsheet, which we have. And again, this is freely available to the public. And that spreadsheet then will call up or bring up to you much information. It is used by researchers worldwide, and it is used as a resource uh, for information for uh, many different fields other than the botanical sciences, by agriculturists, by people who are interested in the environment. The UC Botanical Garden, uh, we're located in a Mediterranean climate, as you know, and therefore we tend to stress plants which grow in a Mediterranean climate. But the point which is sometimes lost on people is that although we're located about 34 degrees uh, above the equator, there is also a Mediterranean climate about 34 degrees below the equator. And that would be in the central portion of South America, in South Africa, and in Australia. And so the UC Botanical Garden has a very rich collection in plants from these Mediterranean climates, not only the Mediterranean climate of the Northern hemisphere, but the Mediterranean climates of the Southern hemisphere. And it's really what distinguishes this garden. The garden uh, has what are known as accredited plant collections. These are collections which are of special use to researchers and to people who are, for example, landscape architects, where we have plants growing of particular types and we have them grouped together in particular collections. I wanna to touch on four collections. Uh, the first one is the collection of oaks. We have a large number of species of oaks growing in the garden and these oaks are widely used for landscaping and uh, the garden provides uh, researchers and also students, for example, in landscape architecture or people who have home gardens, an opportunity to see what these plants are like in their native environment to compare them and to see what the plants would do if they were brought into a Mediterranean environment as we have here in the Bay Area. Again, these are wild collected plants. And so they have their original genetic stock. We also have a large collection of magnolias, 34 different species of magnolias. Many of the magnolias are from um, East Asia and they've just finished flowering, although there are still a large number of magnolias flowering now here in the garden. We have a large collection of ferns. In this particular case, we have over 350 different species of ferns. And one aspect of ferns that's probably lost on many individuals is that uh, many ferns actually grow in very dry environments. They will grow on lava. They are often among the first plants which will be grown in a lava situation. And I wanna say that this is a group of organisms which likely as the world becomes uh, hotter and perhaps drier in some areas, a group of organisms which will spread and a group of organisms that we might want to consider planting in our yards uh, if water is limited. And finally, a collection which I'm going to return to 
is a collection known as cycads. These are plants which, not these particular species, but these are plants as a group which evolved about 300 million years ago, uh, were food for dinosaurs, and uh, they have a very interesting history here in the garden, and I'll return to the history and how we got this collection uh, very shortly. The garden not only is distinguished by the fact that we have over 70% of our plants wild collected, but from this aerial view, you can see that the garden is divided into geographic regions. We group our plants not by how they're related to each other, but by how they are, uh, where they come from. So you can travel the world in California, uh, by, you can travel the world at the Botanical Garden by crossing the road. You can go from South Africa to the desert to Asia. And these are uh, aspects which make the garden unique. Most other botanical gardens group their plants based upon the uh, fact that they're related to each other. Across uh, the street from the botanical garden on the upper left-hand corner of the slide, we have a large redwood grove that I'm going to return to in a moment. Most of you, if you haven't been to the garden before, wouldn't imagine this redwood grove, and I'll, I'll point it out to you in a moment. So the garden has a number of specialized areas, and we'll talk about them shortly. The, the area of the garden, which is the largest, uh, is the California area. This is a map. And in the California area of the garden, and you can see the different areas of the garden here. In the California area of the garden, we have about 30% of all the plant species which grow in California. And a, an amazing collection of plants in a very small area. And of those uh, approximately 2,000 species, about 300 are considered to be endangered or threatened. The garden also has within the California section, because it's highly used for education, we call we have special habitats. And in this particular case, it is listed as 19 special habitats. And these are, to give you an example of the habitats which we have here in the garden, which are meant to indicate the different types of environments which are found in California and the different types of environments which host unique collections of plants. And I'd like to show you a few of the environments and to encourage you when you visit the garden, perhaps to see others, but to certainly spend time on a few of these, which I will show you now. In California, we have a type of soil which is known as serpentine. And serpentine soils contain high concentrations of heavy metals, including chromium, iron, uh, nickel, and cobalt. And as a consequence, many plants cannot grow on soils with high levels of these particular heavy metals. There are some plants which are able to tolerate the heavy metals and they uh, can grow in these areas. And uh, we have serpentine plants in, in a section of the garden to give you an idea of uh, the kinds of challenging environments plants will grow in. Of course, uh, by being on serpentine, many of the competitors are cannot grow. And although the serpentine plants may not grow particularly well or very, very strongly, they're able to grow because uh, they don't have competition from other plants. Serpentine is a very common habitat in California. Another habitat which is common and which we have well represented in the garden is the area of the Alpine because of the high Sierra. Here, the plants are small, low to the ground. They have a short flowering time and it is well represented here in the garden uh, by this particular area here, which is in the California area. A very unique area of California, some of you may have seen this, uh, are the, it's on the Jepson Plain, if you drive up to Sacramento, are known as vernal ponds or vernal pools. These are areas where the land is depressed and water accumulates when it rains in these depressions. And as the water evaporates, different uh, species of plants flower, making a bullseye type of pattern. And uh, we try to duplicate this vernal pool pattern uh, by constructing a vernal pool. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Here you can see what would be a mature vernal pool. And what we do here in the garden is we plant these various species along the side and as the pool dries up, the various species flower in the pattern, which I just showed you earlier. Here is the construction of the vernal pool in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, we have to actually put a, modify the soil, put down a concrete surface, fill it with water, plant the seeds, and then duplicate an environment which is very common on the Jepson Plain, but is disappearing, of course, as humans begin to move into these areas. Another area that some of you may be familiar with, which is very um, characteristic of a northwestern portion of California is the pygmy forest. For those of you who have been up to the North Coast, almost to Oregon, 
there's an area uh, along the coast where the trees are stunted in their height. And they're stunted in their height because the amount of soil in which the plants grow uh, is very thin and it, under, it overlays a hard layer, a layer of hard pan. And therefore the root systems of these plants uh, cannot develop very much and the plants remain dwarfed or pygmy. Uh, we duplicate that environment here in the botanical garden by putting down a layer of concrete and then on top of that layer by putting a shallow layer of soil, therefore duplicating the pygmy forest. So throughout the California section of the botanical garden, you will notice these habitats, which are representative of the ones in California, which we've duplicated here in the garden. We also have uh, areas of the garden which are specific to particular geographic regions. And the area that I wanna really touch upon today is South Africa. South Africa, the South Africa Hill area is an area of the garden where we had to modify extensively the soil. And I would like to put up a uh, sort of a, a point today of mentioning that South Africa Hill is coming into prime flowering this week and next week. And if you visit the botanical garden only once, only one time during the year, this is the time to come. It, it will be spectacular as far as color. You may have to double the layer of sunglasses you have on. It truly is a remarkable experience to see South Africa Hill. Again, South Africa is located in a Mediterranean climate along the coast. Here you can see, this is from last year of South Africa Hill. And as time goes on, more blues and reds will appear and it will be uh, truly a remarkable experience. And I really would like to encourage you given the fact that this talk slightly precedes uh, when this coloring will occur. Opposite or across the street from South Africa Hill are, are the gardens of the Americas, the cacti gardens of the America. And this is a really remarkable garden where we have an unusual collection of cacti and succulents. It's one uh, where you can see these steps going down the middle where we now have handrails to encourage people to uh, visit these areas and to take a look close up from some of these really remarkable organisms. The area of the garden, which was the first area that was actually developed after the grassy area I mentioned earlier, is where Asia is. And our oldest plants are in the Asia area. And uh, right now, again, it's a prime time to visit because the rhododendrons, which come from Bhutan, Nepal, uh, India, uh, China, the rhododendrons are out and they're, they're very spectacular. And many of these rhododendrons are approaching 100 years in age. They were planted in the 1930s and they are spectacular plants. They're almost trees in some regards, really overwhelming to take a look at them. In the Asian area, we have the Japanese pond. Many people find this the most enjoyable part of the garden to visit. Uh, the Japanese pond is surrounded or was surrounded by a number of lanterns. As you can see, Japanese lanterns in the lower left-hand corner. These lanterns actually came to the garden from the 1939 World's Fair. They were brought over here uh, after the fair ended and before the war began with Japan. Here you get a better view of the garden in the fall, a wonderful, relaxing, idyllic place. Right now, the Japanese pond area is a favorite of kids because we have newts which uh, uh, live in the ponds and they're laying their eggs and uh, the newts are swimming about and children and maybe adults as well uh, love to see them. The pond of course is beautiful in the fall as we have here in the picture when it's changing color. The garden also has a number of very specialized gardens and these plants are not wild collected plants. They're often hybrids. And the two gardens that I wanna point out to you or three gardens I wanna point out to you that are specialized. The first one is the medicinal Chinese medicinal herb garden. This garden was uh, started uh, with um, uh, efforts by schools of traditional Chinese medicine in San Francisco. They teach their students how to use uh, dried plants as medicinal products uh, to treating various diseases. And they asked us if we could show the students what the plants looked like when they were alive. And so we were able to, re to get some grants. We developed this garden of medicinal plants. And as you go through the garden, the medicinal plant garden, you will find signage often in Chinese, uh, which indicates to you what the plants are used for in traditional medicine. And some of the plants are quite common. Some of them you may have in your own yards. Uh, it is a very popular garden uh, among especially East Asian visitors. 
The other specialized garden is the culinary herb garden, where we have a large number of plants which are used in cooking. And I encourage you to squeeze the leaves to have a smell as you walk through this garden. And many of these plants, if you find that you like them, are for sale in our plant deck area. The third specialized garden, which is much favored and which I uh, must tell you that I have a, uh, occasional uh, fights with our horticulture staff is the old rose garden, which contains roses, but they're not hybrids. And the old rose garden is a favorite spot of many visitors. It's an extremely fragrant place. And if you come to the old rose garden and you climb up to the top of it, you have a spectacular view of the bay and of the Golden Gate to say nothing of the wonderful plants. So this garden is kind of against the uh, idea we talked about of being a Noah's Ark. This garden consists of plants which are hybridized in which much of the DNA, original DNA of the parent plants has been bred out or otherwise silenced. The garden also has, as I mentioned before, a large redwood grove that most of you may not even know about. Across the street from the main garden, just adjacent to the parking lot, is a large number of redwood trees, almost 500 trees, which were planted uh, during the early 1930s as a WPA work project. It is truly a remarkably uh, emotional experience to go into the Redwood Grove. For most of us, it's easier than going to Muir Woods. You don't have to make a reservation and you can park right next to it and experience what it's like to be in the middle of a giant grove of trees which are only about 90 years old, but which seem like they must be older. In the Redwood Grove, we also have an amphitheater, a wonderful place uh, for hosting concerts. We have weddings there. And here are some of the activities which have gone on in the amphitheater in the lower right hand corner is a wedding going on. And during the summer, at least uh, before COVID struck, uh, we have summer concerts, uh, which are again in the late afternoon and uh, which fill uh, every week of the summer. A wonderful place uh, to have some outdoor activities. Now, I want to return to this idea of the garden being an ark, a place of stored DNA, especially of plants uh, which are endangered. And I wanna to return to the plants that I talked to you about in our fourth special collection, that is the cycads, those plants which evolved about 300 million years ago. Our garden has a very rich collection of these plants. And I wanna tell you how we got them because many of these plants are highly endangered. Many of them have almost disappeared, if have not disappeared from their natural environment. First of all, the cycads are plants which originated before the flowering plants evolved. So they produce a cone. And you can see that there's a cone just pictured on the right to let you see what these plants look like. Um, the cycad, which is pictured here, uh, is listed in 1996 as only 400 to 500 plants known in the world of these plants. The garden was able to acquire several of these plants. And the question is, how did we get these plants? And how did we get other cycads which now give us among the largest collection of cycads in the world? And the answer is shown in the lower portion of the slide in the blue coloring. These plants were obtained by a sting operation of the feds. Cycads, many of the cycads, but not all of them, uh, were, are not allowed to be imported into the United States. Like ivory, uh, they are considered to be endangered. And as a result, um, they are not allowed to be brought in because in bringing them in, uh, most times they are taken from their natural environment. Here is the, a picture of a number of the cycads which were confiscated in about 2005 by the feds, which were brought into the country illegally. And uh, the cycads were given to the UC Botanical Garden to hold while the trial was going on. And at the end of the trial, some of the cycads had died. Uh, some of them, though most of them were still alive and were given to the botanical garden. And all of a sudden we had this very rare, very remarkable collection of highly endangered plants. Now, a few of these cycads, as it turns out, were so rare and uh, so uh, endangered that the owners, and these owners probably were in South Africa and had these plants stolen from them, the owners had microchipped the cycads. So, these cycads, if they had been sold on the market, would sell for, believe it or not, $50,000. That's what collectors would pay for them. But for those that had microchips in them, we were able to return them to the original owners. Although, as you might guess, most of them did not have microchips. And as a result, they stayed in our botanical garden. We are now propagating these cycads, sending the seeds that we get to other gardens, 
cycads come in both males and females, and sometimes we have only one sex. And so, for example, if a male produces pollen and we don't have the female, we write around to a few of the other botanical gardens and ask them if they have females so that we can cross our pollen with that and generate more seeds and more plants. And one of our volunteer propagators spends a lot of time developing and growing cycads, which are then sent around and in some cases released uh, to the public to plant in their gardens. Here is a view of some of these cycads. Again, some of you may know cycads. There's one which is commonly available known as the sago palm, but it actually is a cycad, a plant which evolved about, or the, the plants which produced this evolved about uh, 300 million years ago. Another role that the garden has is in conservation. And this is an activity which is taking on increasing importance in the garden, especially as humans begin to modify the environment to the extent that plants are caused to disappear. The garden receives a large number of grants uh, from, or contracts really, from different federal and private agencies, uh, which ask us to uh, help them repopulate areas where plants once grew historically, but which are now absent. And these are a couple of the plants which we have grown here in the garden and have reintroduced back to the natural environments, repopulated the natural environments where these plants were either uh, eliminated or very rare in the natural environments. And we have been spending a lot of time on the slopes of both Mount Diablo and Mount Tamalpais. Mount Diablo slopes were, as you probably know, get grazed uh, by cattle and by other animals. And that has resulted in the disappearance of many of these plants. How do we do this? Well, here is a, a plant uh, which um, was thought to have disappeared uh, from humanity from the slopes of uh, Mount Diablo in about sometime in the 1920s. Uh, it's in, known as the buckwheat plant. And uh, in about 2005, a graduate student was up on Mount Diablo slope and found what he thought was this plant was a, which was extinct growing on the slopes of Mount Diablo. He came back and he told the garden about this. And we sent a group of individuals out who marked the plant and collected seed. And uh, these seed were then grown up into many, many plants. The seed were collected and then many new plants were started and they were reintroduced then to the slopes of Mount Diablo. So here's a plant which was extinct or near extinction, uh, which the garden was able to repopulate in its natural environment through our conservation efforts and through some contracts. Another plant that some of you may know about is delphinium. This is the delphinium from Marin County. It was known from only one location and uh, that was the only location that people have reported it. Again, the garden collected seed of this plant and grew up the delphinium into small plants and reintroduced them to areas, some of which are now closed uh, to cattle to allow the plants to repropagate. And a more recent one is a plant known as the large flowered fiddle neck plant. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, where the work was sponsored uh, by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Again, large numbers of these plants were grown up, seed were collected, and then they were amplified again and planted out in the environments where historically we knew these plants grew. So the garden has a big role in conservation. We have to devote a lot of effort to it, and we don't always have the personnel, but we have a large number of volunteers and students who help in these projects. Here is the large number, the large neck fiddle neck being planted out uh, on the slopes. And here are some students uh, helping plant it out. And eventually the plant did repopulate the areas that we knew it grew in historically. The garden also has, and this is close to my heart, uh, a role in education. We have a large number of students who come to the garden from lower levels from kindergarten up through universities and colleges throughout the Bay Area. Um, the class I teach on campus, um, Introductory Biology, has the students come up to the garden to do projects. And these students who visit the garden are given docent-led tours. The docents are volunteers who are trained in giving tours, and they provide a vast amount of information and greatly enrich uh, the visit of these students. Here is an interesting example of how the garden became involved in education. And this is a sort of a, sh a short story, but one worth telling to you. This is papyrus growing here in the garden, and we still have these plants growing here. The history of how these papyrus got here is quite interesting and in how they're used in education. In the early 1900s, uh, Mrs. Hurst of the Hearst newspaper fame uh, sponsored an expedition to a town in Egypt called Teptunis. And uh, 
it was an ordinary town and those expeditions uh, collected a large number of papyrus scrolls. And the agreement was that those scrolls were to remain in Egypt for 30 years and then come to Berkeley. So sometime in the 1930s, those scrolls came to Berkeley and were placed in the Campanile. And they were left in the Campanile until about 1980. And uh, by 1980, somebody discovered them and said, we should find out what those scrolls have inside of them. So they hired a papyrologist, a person who specializes in papyri. And this individual translated the papyri, but also was interested in giving the students a class in papyrus. And one of the portions of the class involved how to make papyrus paper uh, from the plants. And so he asked us to plant papyrus here in the garden, and we then provided material for his class. That class is no longer given, but interestingly, we've had calls from a number of other classes for papyrus to be used so that they can demonstrate papyrus paper making. So this way the garden becomes involved in many uh, somewhat odd educational activities, but really is central to our role here at Berkeley. Uh, here is a man in the upper left-hand corner, uh, kind of looking sad down here in the ground. This is the, uh, Professor Dawson. He's interested in studying uh, what goes on in the physiology of the plants, which are very tall. And in this particular case, he and his students uh, climb up to the top of some of the tall redwood trees, which we have growing in our redwood grove, and conduct physiological experiments uh, that, of the physiology of the plants at the top. Uh, we also have a number of specialized classes. For example, uh, these are architecture students who asked us if they could become involved in a project. And in this particular project, we asked them if they could build a bridge crossing over Strawberry Creek. And this is the product of their work. So we really are encouraging educational activities from a wide variety of schools and disciplines here in the garden. And it's really important for us to be involved in education. The garden also has a large number of outreach efforts. Uh, we have a summer camp, which we actually ran last year, and we're going to do it again this year. And we also reach out to many schools. Uh, at times, we are able to receive grants to have school buses. We hire school buses to bring kids up to the garden, and we make sure that they have a wonderful day and often a wonderful week. How does the garden grow? Well, in the old days, the garden used to grow by expeditions, which would go out to countries and collect new plants. Now, these days, expeditions to foreign countries cannot happen. It's dangerous, and often foreign countries do not want to release plants to, to the uh, more um, wealthier countries because they feel the foreign countries don't benefit uh, from these expeditions. So we have to gain new plants by other ways. One way, of course, is here in the United States, in the Mojave Desert, we can still collect plants ourselves. But in most other cases, we have to depend upon material being sent us from other portions of the world by colleagues. And those materials are often seeds, which are sent to us and then which are germinated, grown into plants. But again, those seeds come from areas where we have vast data on them and therefore we can assign them a, a data entry number and they are, again, the original genetic stock. A couple of notable changes, some of you may have seen these with regard to garden infrastructure. If you come up to the garden, you will notice a building, uh, which is a beautiful building. It's called Julia Morgan Hall. This building was designed by Julia Morgan uh, in 1909. Uh, it houses uh, about uh, 90 people and was located on the central portion of the campus, occupying the footprint of a building that the Haas School wanted to put up, but they couldn't tear this down because uh, it's historic. And so this building was cut into thirds, brought up to the UC Botanical Garden and sited here, and it fits perfectly. Uh, as I said, it holds about 90 people. It was the senior women's building when it was first opened in 1909. And here is the interior of the building, looking much the same today uh, as it was in 1909, lacking the, the ladies who are inside. And a point I wanna make, as I mentioned before, is that it holds 90 people, and in 1909, it held every senior woman on the Berkeley campus uh, in this one building. The other new infrastructure change, which I wanna point out to you, and it hasn't quite been completed, is our tropical house. The tropical house is designed to, uh, to teach students about tropical plants that are involved in their daily lives. We don't have a collection of rare tropical plants, which we maintain, uh, plants which we collect from the wild. It is a place where we take students into the tropics and show them plants that are part of their lives 
And right now the tropical house is undergoing renovation. What you see here is the outside of the tropical house, which has been renewed. And we are currently working on renewing the inside of the tropical house to make it a more useful educational experience. This is the way it kind of looks today. And we now have new plans and the new plans involve, uh, if you're standing at the place where you were in the previous slide, having a pond down the center of the pond and down the center of the greenhouse and then pathways on either side allowing people to reach into the plants, whereas before they were kept quite some distance from the plants. So right now we're in the middle of raising funds to redo the interior of the tropical house, and hopefully we'll be able to complete this project this year. How about running a garden? Before I end, I want to just mention to you a couple of aspects of running a garden. Uh, the garden, as you might guess, uh, most of our uh, income is used for salaries and benefits and then the rest of it is for supplies and expenditures. We have about 30 staff in the garden. These are full-time individuals, uh, about 24 student staff, work-study students each year. And we also have a large number of volunteers, over 250 volunteers who are in the garden here, who provide a great resource. They are really important in being able to run the garden. How do we generate uh, revenue for these various activities? Well, obviously there are admissions uh, where we have uh, memberships from people. And we also have a number of other activities. Uh, we have programs, we have the summer concerts that I mentioned to you before. Uh, we have rentals. Rentals are an important part of the garden because surprisingly, a lot of individuals wish to use the garden for venues, either for weddings or for conferences. We have a great gift shop and uh, the gift shop can be viewed online if any are interested. And we have, as you might guess, a large number of plants for sale. And these plants are unusual plants, ones which you cannot find in most other nurseries uh, in the Bay Area. And they are plants which are started from our collection here and are available on our plant deck. And then we have tours. And these tours are again run by the volunteer docents. So they provide a great resource for the garden. Now, if I want to look to the future as to where I'd like to see this garden be in the time that I have left, we still have to renovate our greenhouses. The infrastructure of the garden is quite old and the campus is not invested in the garden. We have to update our irrigation system. Uh, although we don't pay for our water, we still feel responsible for it. And because we're on a hill, uh, the water irrigation system frequently breaks and has to be repaired. I'd like to expand our collection and we have a lot of opportunities to do so. A point which I touched on before is I'd like to expand our education and outreach programs again it's important that we educate the public about the importance of plants to their lives and to the environment. And of course, we want to grow our membership, which is really doing very well, but we're, we are able to get our message out more and able to encourage more people to come to the garden through memberships. So here is uh, the second to the last slide to show you some of the uh, things that go on here in the garden. Uh, by becoming a member, you have a lot of benefits with regard to programs, being notified of programs, you also are uh, given discounts in our plant sale, our nursery. And the other point, which is frequently lost on members or people who are thinking about members, is we have a lot of reciprocal uh, uh, memberships with other gardens and other institutes, for example, the Exploratorium throughout the Bay Area and indeed throughout, throughout the United States. And uh, finally, uh, there are lots of gifts which you can have here in the garden. And so I'll end with the slide uh, that Joe touched on in the beginning, which is the offer. For those of you who might like to become members, uh, this offer is good uh, today and uh, tomorrow, for portions of tomorrow, starting at noon today and running through uh, noon tomorrow or midnight tomorrow night. So with that, uh, I'm very happy to, to end and very pleased uh, to uh, have uh, um, been given this opportunity to talk to you. And I really do appreciate uh, this chance because as I said, it's really important that we understand and appreciate the role that plants have in our lives and the increasing role they're going to play in helping us mitigate climate change. So with that, I'll stop. And thank you very much again for this opportunity. Well, I want to thank you very, very much, Lou, before we go into questions, just for taking time to do this. It's certainly gotten me very excited about visiting. The thank Bayer you, Garden. thank you, Joe. So, uh, Hillary, do you want to go through the chat questions? Uh, sure, yeah. Roger Newman had the first question. Uh, two questions we have coming up. 
uh, not surprisingly about water during the drought. Go ahead, Roger. Oh, I was just uh, struck by uh, the uh, Strawberry Creek running at times. You know, I, I we of, often walk up there in the canyon and, and I see the creek running and I think, well, that can't be um, local sources. <laughs> so it must be coming off the garden. But I, I just wondered, uh, is is do you just use regular East Bay mud water or how does that work? So that's a, a great question. First of all, um, Although I complain about uh, the campus, being associated with the campus, one of the benefits we have with the, being on the campus is uh, the amount of water we use is considered to be a drop in the bucket and we are tied into the central water of the campus. But more importantly, to address your question, the campus wants to have Strawberry Creek running through the campus water. Mm -hmm. It's part of the atmosphere that they're trying to create. And we could shut the water off here, uh, but if we shut it off, the campus gets upset because Strawberry Creek would dry up down there. So we actually, uh, some of the water we have actually leaks from the uh, Tilden side uh, of the, from the other hillside into the gardens reservoir. But some of the water does come through East Bay mud, which we then use through Strawberry Creek. And we have to treat it uh, because it has chloramine in it and because it would kill the newts and also might affect some of the water plants that are actually in there. So as ashamed as I am to say it, we do have a small amount of water, which we release and runs through the campus and is really important for the landscape on the campus. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Roger Pritchard had a question about water too. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm Roger too. <laughs> uh, and, and Roger Newman is Roger one. He always has been. <laughs> so, so, uh, how much water does the garden use annually? And what, what is your thinking about uh, modifying the amount of water and its effect on the garden yeah. as the climate gets hotter? Yes, so the answer to your first question is we don't know how much water we use because it's not metered because it comes up from the central campus and we don't have a meter between then. Uh, what we are doing though, Roger, is uh, we are, uh, we were, the irrigation system, we estimate, the old irrigation system actually loses half the amount of water that we would be normally getting from the from the university and so we're replacing it and already having replaced it we know uh, that the the amount of watering that we have to uh, the amount of watering we we've lost is quite a bit decreased as a result of that replacement we are um, uh, trying to mitigate the amount of watering by uh, putting in a special sprinkler system so we have drip irrigation but I have to confess to you that we don't really know what the answer is to, because some of the plants we have, as I've shown you, for example, the ones from Asia come from areas where it's quite moist. So I feel, I feel it's kind of a, I'm taking the easy way out, but it's an honest answer that we haven't really confronted it yet in the way that we probably are gonna to need to in the future. Okay, any other questions? If you want to put on your video, wave your hand or raise your hand using the virtual hand, please go ahead. Don't have to type. Well, I have a question uh, uh, for, for Lewis. Tell me about the Norwegian Seed Bank and if you have any actions, interactions yeah. with, with them, please. Right. So I, I don't know a lot about the Norwegian Seed Bank, but I do know that it is an air, it's, a, it's embedded in a mountain, deep in a mountain where uh, seeds, uh, especially of plants that are endangered, but uh, plants which are important uh, to humanity, uh, wheat, uh, food plants uh, are, are kept and are maintained in an environment which would prolong the uh, lifetime of the seeds. And then the, when the seeds no longer are viable, uh, they are re replaced. Now, our interaction with them is probably very minimal, but we do actually have a seed bank here in the garden. We uh, right now have, are collecting seed from all endangered plants in California. And we have several freezers where we keep those seeds. And we also have a program where we send seeds, which we have in our seed bank uh, to other gardens and to other individuals throughout California and indeed throughout the world. So it is something which, uh, although exists in much larger, uh, sort of for plants which are important for food crops in, in Norway, here we actually have it for plants that are less likely to be food crops, but plants which are part of the natural flora of California. 
So we are interested in it. And it's something that uh, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about. Getting more freezers is, a, is another object that we'd like to consider. Do we have another question here? Uh, Audrey has a question. Audrey, unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, um, Lou, I'm delighted that you could come and give a talk to us. Um, it's been very, very interesting. And um, I, I was interested in some of the research projects that UC is doing using uh, the plants and the DNA from the wild types that right. we have here. Right. So the first thing I have to say, and I'm a member of the plant and microbial biology department, is that most of the faculty in plant and microbial biology um, are molecular biologists, and they uh, study um, the molecular biology of a few model plants. So very, very few of them use the botanical garden. Uh, for them, the garden consists of plants which are um, uh, not model plants, plants which are more difficult to work with. But, and, and they're generating from their DNA analyses, vast databases as is happening throughout the world. But that information that they're generating now is only going to make sense when it is brought back to plants in the natural environment. And in this way, the UC Botanical Garden is kind of something which is sort of a library. We're here, but we're not heavily used in many ways until we'll be used in the future when that data has to be integrated back into the original plants that it in evolutionary that it came from. We do have some members of the faculty using the garden for their research. And these individuals, interestingly enough, were forced to use the garden during the pandemic because they couldn't go out and travel around. And they discovered actually the utility of the garden. But I have to confess to you that most of the research which is done with the garden collection is not done by faculty at Berkeley, but is done by faculty who come from all parts of the world. For example, we had an individual from Pennsylvania who came here who collected a tissue from plants growing in various areas of the garden. And if this person had gone out and tried to collect these materials in their natural environments, it would have taken a month and he would have had to travel around the world. So we provide these materials free, gratis to individuals, and uh, they use the garden but those individuals, and there are quite a number actually, are generally not from the Berkeley campus. And that's just the way uh, research is going these days in big places like Berkeley. It tends to focus on what, what's the hot item, not what's the item which is going to have payback in the future. Thanks. Sure. Sorry um, to have to say that, but it's true. <laughs> uh, Jan had a question. Jan, do you want to uh, unmute and ask your question? If not, a question was in the chat. She said, um, is the garden related to the Swanson Farm in Santa Cruz? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, you know, um, there are several botanical gardens at UC campuses. There's, there's one at Santa Cruz. Uh, but I don't know whether it's the same. Uh, it, it, it's a different garden. We may interact with it, but I, I don't know about that one. There's also a garden at Davis or an arboretum at Davis, and there are ones at uh, other UC campuses. But I don't know specifically the answer to your question. Uh, I have another Roger. question. Uh, Roger has a follow up. Uh, this is about the Redwood Grove. Sure. Uh, as I, I looked at the slides and, and having been there, it seems very crowded. So I'm wondering if you have a program to thin the, the trees in order to keep it healthy. Yeah, so that's a really good question. We have had uh, interactions with the Save the Redwood League and they actually come up and uh, give us advice on what we should do, what we should thin out. You're right. So the answer is we are uh, following their guidelines and following their suggestions. And we're not ignoring that. There, it's a really good point you make, Roger. Yeah. And by the way, that that redwood grove is named after uh, the the founder uh, of the uh, National Park Service. So, um, and many of those details were worked out here at Berkeley in the twenties. Joe. Uh, I have to ask this question. 
um, imagine a scenario where there's been an ecological disaster. The land is barren, but once again, able to uh, grow some kind of plants. Is it better to use a pure DNA original plant or does a hybrid plant have some kind of a, a survival advantage? Yeah, so generally, if you look at, for example, around Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, the, the first plants which came back in there uh, often were uh, mosses and liverworts, things that were easily established and didn't have high requirements. Uh, as far as the nutrition, because there was no soil there. Um, I guess the answer, and the answer I'm gonna give you is it depends. I think you have a greater chance of being able to adapt to uh, that type of an environment, a new environment totally destroyed and now open for recolonization by plants, which have probably in their past also encountered that type of a situation and have therefore built into their genetic bank uh, ways of adapting to that type of an environment. Whereas if you have a hybrid, it would just be a chance. It may still have those, that DNA to allow it to adapt to that environment. And it may do perfectly well, but it also, it would in, be increasingly less likely compared to a wild type plant. Okay, thank you. Any other questions here before we close up? I'm wondering what your relationship is to the botanical garden in Tilden and yes. whether you support each other and how. Yeah. Well, you know, that we have frequently have people getting mixed up. They mean to go to one garden and not the other, and they wind up at the, the wrong place. So that's an odd relationship. But um, the the relationship is that Tilden Botanical Garden is is California. They stress California plants and they take much better care of their plants than we have here. Their California plants look wonderful. Uh, I, I've been up to the garden and I'm very envious. Uh, we frequently, the other relationship is we frequently lose some of our horticulture staff to Tilden because I think they pay more than the university. Uh, and we do try to exchange plants. One of the problems we have in Strawberry Canyon, and this is uh, probably in California in general, is that historically Strawberry Canyon has burned. And one of the questions is, should we put all of our eggs in one basket? In other words, only keep our plants here and uh, hopefully you won't burn and destroy them. And so one of the things that we do with Tilden, although we're not that far apart, but we also do with several other botanical gardens, including San Francisco and the Huntington in Southern California, is we change plants, we exchange plants. So we have duplicates in these various other gardens. So we have worked with Tilden to make sure that we have duplicates of their plants, which are especially the rare ones and the reverse. I would say that's the, the biggest cooperation that we have going with them right now, except for the fact that we send them new staff occasionally. I have one more question. Uh, how do you think the plants will do when the Hayward Fault uh, erupts? Yeah, so uh, uh, we're, we're prepared for that in a slight way. One of the uh, old structures which exists or which continue to exist on the garden property when we moved up here after it was a farm are two large tanks which held water for the cattle. And uh, they are nearly at the top of the garden and one of the tanks is completely filled with water and the other we have to get a new liner on it to uh, fill it with water again. And we hope to use those tanks to gravity feed the water down to where the plants are, the ones that are most in need or the ones that are rarest. But the answer is, I hope I never have to answer that question, okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the gallery here? So I, I just wanna say, Joe, thank you again for the invitation and, and Hillary, I really appreciate this opportunity. Oh, well, back at you, Lou. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the generous offer. I really encourage all of you to read that email again and consider joining the uh, UC Botanical Garden Society. Sarah and I will. I can say Thank that. you very much. I think Mary Lee has a last question. Well, it's just a comment. I just joined. Oh, congratulations. Family, Thank you. And, uh, and my husband and I will be up there with friends. All right. Make sure if, you, if you're here that you ask at the booth and I will, the entry booth, and ask for me to come over. And if I'm free, I'd like to meet you. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure enough. Yeah, I do a lot of photography with Becky Jaffe, who has yes. 
who has been kind yes. of your garden artist. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Please, so, yeah, please let me know. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's lovely. Okay. Hey, thank you all again. Okay. Uh, for joining us. Hillary, could you stay on for a minute, please? Sure. <laughs> You're Thank in trouble, you, everyone. Hillary. Good to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming next month. Okay. Enjoy your trip, Joe. Uh, okay. Thanks, Steve. Stay <laughs> out of trouble, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Audrey. <laughs> hey.